<laughs> Hi, welcome. Uh, my name is Deborah Gonzalez, and I'm the Director of Government Affairs from, for PPIC, and I want to thank you for joining us today. For those of you who are not familiar with our organization, PPIC is a nonpartisan nonprofit that has both offices in Sacramento and San Francisco. They write at San Francisco, Sacramento, but I think Sacramento is more important. Today's event is part of the James Irvine Foundation Briefing Series, and we want to thank them for making this presentation possible and for providing us lunch today. We are going to hear about the findings from our latest PPIC statewide survey on Californians and their government. We'd like to again thank the Irvine Institute, our foundation, for support of the survey, as well as the PPIC donor circle. You should have received a handout at registration, which contains some key findings about the survey, the full survey, as well, as well as the slides about today's presentation are available now online at ppic.org. You'll also find on our website an interactive survey tool which you can create your own cross tabs by political party, ideology, region, age, and categories. I highly recommend this provision, I'm, this piece. I actually go on and play in it, and I torment our researchers with it all the time. But you can find out some really interesting things using this, um, this tool. Just a couple of thoughts before we begin. When I first read this month's survey, it felt like the electric, electorate was pretty negative. They were in a pretty negative mood. Only 42% of voters like their choice of presidential candidate, down from 66% in 2012. And 24% of likely voters said they would not vote in the US, uh, US Senate seat election. While voters did not like their choice of candidates, most of them had made up their mind about who they were gonna vote for. But interestingly, those people, same people who didn't like their candidates and who had made up their mind 90% of them are interested in watching the presidential <coughs> debate, which suggested something to me. Either Californians are going to play some really interesting drinking games during the debate, <laughs> or they're really wanting to see a slow motion car crash. I'm not sure. There was one standout positive voter response I wanted to bring to your attention. 61% of voters were satisfied with the initiative process suggesting that they guard their interest and their ability to vote on initiatives, then this is the year for them. As you know, there are 17 ballot initiatives, statewide ballot initiatives, and I just received my voter guide in the mail. It is a whopping 222 pages. In addition to this light reading that I'll have beside my bedside at night, helping me go to sleep, there are 228 local tax measures that are going to be on the ballot and 199 bond measures that are proposed to be on the ballot. For those of you who are lucky enough to live in San Francisco, the supervisors showed some restraint and brought the local initiatives down from 40 to 25. Again, making me happy I live in Sacramento. So for many, so with so many competing initiatives, we could not pull on each and every one of them. There's only so much time people will take away from Pokemon Go to answer their phones. So we asked questions on four of the 17 initiatives. The tobacco tax, the school bond, the extension of Prop 30, and the legaliz legalization of marijuana. I'm sure if you look at the crosstabs, you'll find many interesting pieces of information about this. I particularly suggest looking at the marijuana crosstabs will, will surprise you in many ways. Now on to the presentation. Dean Bonner is an associate survey director at PPIC. He has expertise in public opinion and survey research, political attitudes and participation, and voting behavior. For people like Dean, this is like Christmas. I mean, it's a very exciting time for him. So after the presentation, we'll open up to questions. Thanks, Dean. Thank you very much, Deborah. And uh, as, as a resident of San Francisco, yes, I was happy that it came down from 39 or 40 down to 25. So add that to the 17 statewide. And I, I do have my homework uh, set out for me. Um, in addition to the interactive crosstabs tool, we do actually put a PDF of crosstabs for each question um, among all adults and likely voters. If you just wanted to look at a PDF and kind of flip through it in a, uh, in a kind of uh, easier way, perhaps. 
So the mission of the statewide survey is to provide timely, relevant, nonpartisan data on political, social, and economic opinions that we hope will inform and improve state policy making, raise awareness, and encourage discussion. Since 1998, we have completed over 150 surveys and given a voice to nearly 330,000 uh, Californians. As Deborah said, uh, this survey today is part of the Californians in Their Government series, which is funded by the James Irvine Foundation, so we thank them, and by the PPIC Donor Circle. So this survey was uh, fielded earlier this month from September 9th to uh, 18th. It's, it was conducted 50% on landline and 50% on cell phone. And we talked to just over 1,700 adults and just over 1,000 of those we deem likely voters. The margin of error for those groups are 3.5% and 4%. So keep that in mind as we talk about some of these differences uh, across these races. In the first section of the report, we look at uh, views on the presidential race, as well as the U.S. Senate race, as well as Deborah mentioned, four key ballot propositions. In the back half of the report, we looked at views on the initiative process, as well as perceptions of immigration policy proposals. So as the presidential election nears uh, the home stretch, Hillary Clinton continues to have a wide lead over Donald Trump. Um, that lead today is 16 points. Uh, that lead was also 16 points in our July survey. Um, <clears throat> the Democratic ticket of Clinton and Cain has the support of over 8 in 10 Democrats, while the Republican ticket of Trump and Pence has the support of just over 7 in 10 Republicans. So there's a little bit more uh, coalescing among Democrats for their candidate than among Republicans. Um, it, we find that independent likely voters favor Clinton over Trump, Trump, but it's important to note that one in five independent voters would vote for a, a minor party candidate. Clinton leads Trump by wide margins among Latinos and members of other racial groups, uh, while white likely voters are divided. It's important to note that we weren't able to break out uh, the findings of uh, Asian American and African American likely voters separately, but throughout the report I'll mention a, a other racial group which is African Americans, Asian Americans, and those of mixed races, um, and, and other races as well. So um, we also find today that there's a gender gap with Clinton. While Clinton leads Trump among men and women, her lead is, is much higher among, much larger among women than men. So satisfaction with their choice of political of presidential candidates, we, we've seen that since December when we first asked this question, we've seen a at least a slight decline in satisfaction across parties. And today, just as Deborah mentioned, just 42% of likely voters are satisfied with their choices, and 56% are not satisfied. Satisfaction among all likely voters today is lower than it was in September 2008 and 2012 when two and three likely voters were satisfied. And while satisfaction is relatively low, we find that attention to news uh, is not. In fact, 61% of likely voters today say that they are very closely following news about candidates for president. In comparison, just about half of likely voters in each September since 2000, uh, each presidential election September since 2000, uh, we're very closely following. So while their satisfaction is down, the attention to news is up, which is quite interesting. Majorities across parties say they're very closely following news, and Trump supporters are more likely than Clinton supporters to say uh, that they're very closely following news. So with the first presidential debate coming up on Monday night, uh, you know, going up against Monday night football, of course, um, we wanted to gauge likely voters' interest in the upcoming debates. We find that six in 10 likely voters, including majorities across parties, are very interested in the debates, and nearly 
all, or at least somewhat interested. Notably, we find that 7 in 10 Trump supporters are very interested in the debates compared to 6 in 10 Clinton supporters. Interest is roughly similar across age, education, income, and racial ethnic groups. So interest is pretty broad. And with interest high in the presidential election and, and debates, we also wanted to ask about which issues uh, likely voters wanted to hear presidential candidates talk about. And jobs and economy came out as, as the top issue, followed by immigration, foreign policy, uh, and terrorism or national security. Jobs in the economy and immigration come in first among Trump, first and second among Trump supporters and Clinton supporters. And while, while Trump and Clinton supporters name jobs in the economy similarly, Trump supporters are more likely to name immigration as the top issue than our Clinton supporters. So as a result of the top two primary system, the race to succeed Barbara Boxer in the U.S. Senate involves two Democrats. This marks the first time we have seen same, a same party race at the statewide level and is creating a situation where one in four likely voters say they would not vote in the U.S. Senate race and another one in five say they're undecided. Harris currently leads Sanchez by seven points overall and by 10 points if you exclude the 24% of people who say they would not vote in this race. Harris led Sanchez by 18 points in our July survey, and looking back a little bit further, before the June primary, she led Sanchez by eight points in our May survey. About half of Democrats support Kamala Harris, while about three in 10 Democrats support Loretta Sanchez. Among Republicans, the notable finding is that 42% say that they would not vote in the U.S. Senate race, and another 20% say that they're undecided. So that's a big block of votes right there that could really have a say in what happens come November. Independents are fairly evenly divided between supporting Harris, supporting Sanchez, and saying they would not vote. Nearly six in 10 Latinos support Sanchez, while Harris is preferred among whites and among other racial groups. Just under half of likely voters say that they're satisfied with their choices of U.S. Senate candidates. But as you can see, there's a wide partisan divide here, with three in four Democratic likely voters saying they're satisfied, compared to just one in four Republican likely voters and we find the independents are pretty much divided in their satisfaction. We also find that two and three Latinos are satisfied with their choices compared to just four and 10 white likely voters. So in addition to the presidential and Senate races, we chose a few key ballot propositions. This is a somewhat tedious task because there are 17 and there's a lot of very interesting and very important topics that will be decided by voters. However, we chose four that we think uh, are at least some of the key propositions. So Proposition 51 would authorize the state to issue $9 billion in, uh, in bonds to fund construction and modernization of K-12 schools and community college facilities. This, the fiscal analysis from the LAO office of this proposition estimates that it would cost about $17.6 billion in total to pay off the principal and the interest. And so this was part of the description that was read to, uh, to respondents in our survey. And when you read this ballot label and summary, uh, we find that 47% of likely voters would vote yes, 43% would vote no, and about one in 10 are undecided. Six in 10 Democrats are in favor, while six in 10 Republicans are opposed, and independents are slightly more likely to say they would vote yes than vote no. Latinos are much more likely than whites to support Proposition 51, and support declines as age increases. In addition to the yes-no uh, vote on the proposition, 
for each proposition, we also asked about the importance of the outcome. And in the case of Proposition 51, we find that about 4 in 10 likely voters called the outcome of Proposition 51 very important. Um, we also found that those who say they would vote yes are much more likely than opponents of Proposition 51 to say that it is very important. So if we had to say there's a little bit more enthusiasm on the yes side than the no side. And for each of these propositions, we also asked a tracking question that we asked outside of the election process. And in this case, we found that general support for a statewide school bond uh, was about 61%, which is obviously higher than the 47% who said they would support the proposition in specific. So there's a little disconnect there when it comes to um, support overall versus the actual proposition. And I would guess that part of that has to be to do with when you read exactly how much the payments would be each year and what the interest would be and what the, you know, the details of the actual proposition. So Proposition 55 is a citizen's initiative that would extend by 12 years the temporary tax on, on earnings over $250,000 that was enacted in 2012 as part of Proposition 30. Revenues from this tax increase would be allocated to K-12 schools, community colleges, and in certain years, health care. And when you read the ballot label and title, just over half of likely voters say that they would vote yes, 38% say they would vote no, and 8% are undecided. An overwhelming majority of Democrats, uh, as well as a slight majority of independents, would vote yes, while 6 in 10 Republicans would vote no. We find that support is higher among lower income and younger Californians, but at least half of likely voters with household incomes of 80,000 or above and those who are 55 or older say they would vote yes. And so there is pretty broad support there. We find that Latinos and members of other racial ethnic groups are much more likely than whites to support Proposition 55. And regarding the importance of, of Proposition 55, once again, we find that about 4 in 10 likely voters say that the outcome is very important. And there's not a, a, a big difference between those who would vote yes on this issue and those who would vote no when it comes to the importance. When we asked our, our tracking question on this regarding just raising taxes on high-income earners in California, we find that a similar 59% of likely voters are in favor. So Proposition 56 would increase by $2 per pack the uh, cigarette tax in California to fund health care, tobacco use prevention, and law enforcement. This marks the third time in recent years that, that increases to the cigarette tax has been on the ballot, and prior measures in November 2006 and June 2012 narrowly failed. When read the ballot title and label, Today, we find that 59% of likely voters would vote yes on this, 36% would vote no, and just 5% are undecided on this. Um, not surprisingly, partisans are divided on this tax measure with three and four Democrats and nearly six and ten independents supporting the proposition and half of Republicans opposed. There is broad support for the cigarette tax increase across age, education, and income groups with more than 55% of likely voters across this group, groups in support of the proposition. When we ask about the importance of Proposition 55, 43% of likely voters say the outcome is very important, and uh, with half of yes voters compared to 35% of no voters saying that this is very important. So in this case, there's a little bit more enthusiasm among yes voters than among no voters. And when we asked a tracking question that we've asked for a number of years, we find that general support for increasing the cigarette tax um, is at 64%, which is similar to the 59% for the proposition. So as Deborah mentioned, there's some really interesting findings when it comes to Proposition 64, which would legalize marijuana under state law for use by adults 21 and older and impose state taxes on the sales and cultivation. Just six years ago in Proposition 19, 
also attempted to legalize marijuana and narrowly failed. Today, when we read the ballot title and label, 60% of likely voters would vote yes, 36% would vote no, and just 4% are undecided. Once again, we find a partisan divide here with two and three, nearly two and three Democrats and independents saying they would vote yes, while Republicans are slightly more likely to vote no than yes. Half of likely voters uh, call the outcome of this proposition very important, which is higher than the other three that we asked about. And notably, no voters are much more likely than yes voters to view the outcome as very important. And this is similar to the pattern that we saw in September 2010 in the lead up to the uh, vote on Proposition 19. Um, when asked our tracking question on general support for marijuana legalization, we find a nearly identical 61% of likely voters in favor. And that's something that since the 2010 election, uh, when we started asking that question in May 2010, we've seen a slow increase among likely voters uh, where, where today we find 61% uh, in favor. So taking a step back and looking at each of these propositions through the lens of the presidential race, we find that Clinton supporters are far more likely than Trump supporters to say that they would vote yes on each of these measures. So by at least 15 to 20 points on each of these measures, if not more, Clinton supporters would vote yes to, to no. So now we'll look at the back half of the survey, which touches upon state and national issues. And to begin with, we'll look at approval of our state elected officials. We find that Californians continue to have a positive view of Governor Jerry Brown. And today marks uh, the uh, 18th survey in a row where we found the governor enjoying majority approval. And this dates back to April 2014. Governor Brown has the approval of an overwhelming majority of Democrats, while the majority of Republicans disapprove, and independents are slightly more likely to approve than disapprove of the governor. Approval of the governor is highest in the San Francisco Bay Area and lowest in Orange San Diego at 48%. Approval of the state legislature continues to hover around about 40% or more as it has since April 2014. And while two and three Democrats approve of the state legislature, um, we find that one in five Republicans do so. It's interesting to note that uh, more Republicans approve of Governor Brown than approve of the state legislature. 31% for Governor Brown, 20% for the state legislature. Um, we also find that when we look at these two questions in, uh, in a combined fashion, that about 40% of Californians approve of both the governor and the legislature, uh, while 23% approve, sorry, while 23% disapprove of both. Um, and so that's a generally positive assessment of state government when you combine those two. Um, we also asked about uh, a respondent's own assembly or senate member approval. And we find that just under half of Californians approve of their own assembly or Senate member. And this is an increase from 38% in October 2014 before the last uh, time most of these folks were up for re-election. So turning to approval of federal elected officials, President Obama continues to, uh, to have an approval that hovers um, around 60% or higher as it has been since January 2015. There's a wide partisan divide when it comes to the approval of President Obama with about nine in 10 Democrats in favor and eight in 10, sorry, nine in 10 Democrats approving and eight in 10 Republicans disapproving. We find that six in 10, Republic, six in 10 independents approve of the job that, that Barack Obama is doing as president. When it comes to Congress, just three in 10 Californians approve, and fewer than one in four uh, have approved, uh, <coughs> sorry. There is also a partisan 
There is also partisan agreement when it comes to disapproval of Congress. So this is one area where we see some bipartisan agreement where um, most Democrats, Republicans, and independents disapprove of Congress. And compared to adults in recent surveys, Californians in our survey are more approving than those of adults nationwide. Um, we find that nearly all Clinton supporters approve of President Obama, while nearly all Trump supporters disapprove. And while just one in five Clinton supporters approve of Congress, just one in 10 Trump supporters approve of Congress. So there's definitely, even though it's a really low share of, of Clinton supporters, it's even lower among Trump supporters. When we look at approval of a respondent's own House representative, we find that 47% of Californians approve, and this is similar to the 48% who approved in October 2014. So as we head towards the election, we also wanted to gauge kind of how Californians are feeling in general about the state. Um, and we find that uh, in both cases, Californians and likely voters are uh, or for the most part optimistic about where the state is, not, not highly optimistic, but just about half of, of Californians say this. We find that majorities of Democrats hold positive perceptions, while majorities of Republicans are pessimistic, and independents are pretty divided on, on both of these questions. Pessimism among Republicans is well established with fewer than four in 10 Republicans uh, saying that they've been optimistic, and this dates all the way back to January 2008. So this is a, a really steady finding among Republicans that they're just not satisfied with the direction or the economic future of the state. Um, we find that 36% of Californians say that both the state is headed in the right direction and expect good economic times and 29% of Californians are pessimistic on both of these measures. So as Deborah mentioned, we wanted to look at the initiative process, and uh, you know, we find that about 64% of Californians say they're satisfied with the initiative process, and that's a great finding, but when you look at the small blue bar there, you see that just 13% of adults and 12% of likely voters are very satisfied with the initiative process. So while there's broad-based satisfaction, when it comes to the perception that they're very satisfied, this is much lower. And we found that majorities of Californians and likely voters have been satisfied in each time that in 12 surveys dating back to 2000 that we've asked this question. So there has been this, this satisfaction going way back in time. However, each time we've asked this question, fewer than one in five have been very satisfied. So once again, they're happy about the initiative process. In other questions, we found that they think it's a good thing that they can make policy. They think that the policies they make are probably better than the policies that the governor and legislature makes. However, th there isn't a high level when it comes to uh, very satisfied. And we also find that while majorities across parties are satisfied with the process, Republicans are much more likely than Democrats to say they are not satisfied. And while 6 in 10 say they're satisfied with the process, we still find that 54% of Californians and 64% of likely voters say that special interest has a lot of control over the initiative process. So this may get at kind of why there's this broad-based support, but not a kind of, um, there aren't a whole lot of people who are very satisfied. So more than half of Californians and more than six in 10 likely voters have said that special interests have a lot of control in seven surveys dating back to 2005. So once again, this is a very persistent finding when it comes to how people feel about the initiative process and the role that special interests play. Republicans and independents are more likely than Democrats to say that special interest has a lot of control. However, there is a fairly high number across the board when it comes to parties. Six in 10 uh, white Californians say that special interest exerts a lot of control compared to about half in other racial ethnic groups. Notably, 
Even among those who say they're very satisfied with the initiative process, 54% say that special interests have a, a lot of control. So even when we just look at that small group who say they're very satisfied, this, the persistence when it comes to the, how people view special interests continues there. So given that there are these 17 propositions on the ballot, we also wanted to kind of gauge people's perceptions of the number of ballot measures and, and whether or not they think that there are too many propositions on the ballot. It's important to note that this is a general question that we ask outside of election context as well. So this isn't a case where we told them, hey, there are 17 ballot propositions. Do you think this is too many? This is just a general assessment of if they think that in general there are too many propositions. So we find that about 6 in 10 Californians and likely voters, as well as registered voters across parties, agree that there are too many propositions on the ballot. And if we go back to the last time there was a similar number of propositions on the ballot, propositions on the ballot, there would be in 2004 when there were 16 propositions on the ballot. We find that about uh, the findings were similar then as well. And so this is a pretty consistent finding, regardless of whether or not there's uh, there's a lot of propositions or not. Um, another common criticism of the initiative process is that the the ballot measures are often too complicated and confusing to know whether or not a yes vote means this or a yes vote means that. Um, and so what we find here is that um, even more Californians and likely voters agree that ballot measures are too complicated and confusion, confusing compared to too many. And so it's often, you know, you often read, that, oh, there are too many ballot measures on the ballot. However, people to a higher degree, think that these ballot measures are, are often too complicated and confusing. And uh, so when we look at the group of people who say they're very satisfied with the initiative process, once again, that 13%, we find that about 6 in 10 agree that there are too many propositions on the ballot, and 76% agree that, there are, that measures are too complicated and confusing. So once again, the satisfaction is kind of a broad gauge of how they feel about the initiative process. But th in, in these questions, as well as other questions about the need for change, we find that Californians and likely voters say that, you know, hey, it's a good process, but there could be some uh, tweaks that could happen. So immigration, and specifically what should happen to undocumented immigrants currently living in the United States has become a topic of discussion uh, at the presidential level. Californians, as they have consistently illustrated over years in, in response to a number of, and a variety of questions, think that undocumented immigrants currently living in the U.S. should be allowed to stay if certain requirements are met. There's bipartisan agreement on this assessment, um, although Democrats and independents are much more likely than Republicans are hold, to hold this view. When we look at this policy through the lens of, of the presidential race, we find that nearly all Clinton supporters say that undocumented immigrants should be allowed to stay, while Trump supporters are more divided on the issue with 52% saying that they should be allowed to stay. So even among Trump supporters, we find that half, half say that these folks should be allowed to stay if there are um, certain requirements that are met. Shifting from kind of what should happen to immigrants overall to the idea uh, of, of Donald Trump's, which is to build a wall across the entire uh, U.S. border with Mexico, we, we don't find that level of bipartisan agreement. In fact, we find that just one in four adults, um, one in three likely voters, and just 11% of Democrats say that they're in favor compared to 60% of Republicans. When we look at adults nationwide in a recent ABC News Washington Post poll, we find that they're slightly more likely to be in favor of this. However, still just one in three say that they uh, favor this proposal. Across parties, 
overwhelming majorities of Democrats and two and three independents are, in, are, are opposed to this. Um, however, six and 10 Republicans are, are in favor, as I mentioned. Not surprisingly, eight and 10 Trump supporters are in favor of building the wall compared to just 7% of Clinton supporters. So once again, that's not surprising given that this is kind of a, a big part of, of what Donald Trump has kind of laid out as his immigration platform. So in conclusion, we find that once again today, Hillary Clinton leads Donald Trump by a wide margin, 16 points today as it was in, in July, and that most likely voters are not satisfied with their choices of candidates. Despite this, we do find that you know, 6 and 10 are very closely following news, so um, that's notable. And we also find that 6 and 10 likely voters are very interested in the upcoming debates, with 3 and 10 saying that jobs and the economy is the issue they're most interested in hearing candidates discuss. We find today that Kamala Harris leads Loretta Sanchez by seven points, with one in four likely voters saying they will not vote in this race. When we recalculate taking out these 24% uh, who say they will not vote, the race uh, expands to a 10-point lead for uh, Harris. We find that in the lead up to the election, Californians are optimistic about the direction of the state and have positive perceptions by elected officials, but there's a wide partisan divide here, as well as a divide among Clinton supporters and Trump supporters. And while most Californians are satisfied with the initiative process, majority say the process is controlled by special interests. And most Californians say that there should be a way for undocumented immigrants to stay in the U.S. legally and oppose building a wall along the border. So that's what I have for you today. I think it's a very interesting story, story that we've kind of uh, weaved together. And we, we look forward to kind of revisiting this in, a, in about a month or so. Um, but I welcome any questions that we may have today. Thank you. Yes. Hold on one second, though. If you have a question, just hold off so we can get a mic so that we can hear. I was interested in the difference between the, if, if you tabulate it between the cell phone people and the landline people. What's the different demographics or political affiliation, likelihood to vote, or whatever, if there are any? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, unfortunately, given our kind of compressed time schedule this time, uh, we weren't able to do a lot of kind of secondary analysis of that. But that's that's always interesting. We do know that you know the cell phone sample tends to be a little bit younger, and so you could kind of look at some of those those age findings and kind of apply some of that to there. Um, but that's something that we do kind of look at from time to time, and you know perhaps it would be a, a blog piece moving forward. Yes. Question whether there was any more depth on their view of their assembly, or sorry, their legislature, particularly assembly, but um, is there any more depth on issues or on the kinds of things you talked about? They voted, they support their members, the levels of the, that support. But is there any sense, is there any depth of knowledge or understanding of anything that the legislature's done in the last few years? Or is there anything coming out on why those numbers ended up what they were? Um, that's not something that we've looked at in this survey, and, you know, and, and we tend to kind of, in, in non-election surveys, we'll ask kind of what's the most important problem that people are thinking about, and we ask a lot of different policy questions. So we find that voters are aware of, of kind of, you know, uh, some of the things, but we, given the kind of, the, the way the survey is, is put together, it's, it's not something that we ask a lot of knowledge questions about how much people know. Outside of during our budget surveys, we often ask them what the top spending area in the general fund is and what's the top uh, uh, revenue source. And what we find there is, is, is um, that in general, Californians and likely voters uh, aren't aware of, of what's the top spending category. In fact, often we'll find that you know, a, a plurality approaching uh, half among likely voters will say that prisons and corrections is the top spending category. Um, they're a little bit better when it comes to the uh, top revenue source. But unfortunately, um, 
given that we're asking more and more cell phones, which take a little bit more time, we weren't able to delve into a lot of knowledge-based questions about kind of how much they know for about a certain policy, except in the case of, um, you could look at our April survey where we touch upon uh, education policy and we ask people uh, how much they would say they know about like Common Core and about the LCFF. But outside of that, uh, I really can't think of, of much else. Yeah. Oops. Another? Yes. Uh, do the, do how people feel about the, how things are going to be going economically or any subset of people, does it have any predictive power, whether it's a positive correlation or a, a negative correlation? Um, I, we haven't delved into that all that much, but there is the kind of connection uh, among, you know, people looking at it the other way that, you know, like among kind of Trump supporters or Clinton supporters, their view is different. So I, I would imagine that kind of there is at least somewhat of a correlation between those people, you know, who, who, who say things are going poorly tend to uh, have more negative views about the governor or the legislature or about Congress, um, just because uh, there's often a, a kind of um, negative kind of series, a negative responses to a series of kind of broad overall questions about the, the, the government or about the mood or about, you know, uh, uh, other certain policies. So I hope that answers it. Yeah. Did it surprise you that while most of the, the respondents are saying they're not happy with Congress and the legislature, but their person is fine? Yeah, that's, that's a pretty common uh, thing that we find, especially now the difference between uh, how people feel about their own assembly member and the legislature overall is really uh, much smaller than it used to be. So when the legislature was down in, in, in the uh, 20s, let's say, there was a much bigger gap because there's a consistent basis when it comes to how you feel about your own assembly member, um, you know, hovering yeah, maybe between 45 and 55, let's say, whereas the legislature really kind of ebbs and flows a little bit more. Um, views of Congress have been low for a really long time, and so you do see that views towards uh, your own person is a little bit higher, and I think that's just there's a more personal co of connection. You may know th specific things that, you know, y your person has done compared to kind of, oh, you know, Congress is terrible. They don't do anything, you know, and, 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 and the media narrative is often about the body as a whole. Like when the legislature was consistently having trouble passing budgets on time, there was a really big drop in the, in the approval of the legislature. Because why? Because it was in the news that the legislature can't even do this basic task. And so, but meanwhile, you may think that your own representative is m taking a stand for you, the people, or, or, you know, and so there is that kind of relationship. It's kind of, as the legislature is going up, though, it really has, uh, the difference has really uh, slimmed down, though. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Um, I'm curious about, you said that uh, there's very low presidential support overall just with any of the candidates, yet six and ten are interested in what's going on. Does that mean um, that a lot of them will be uh, up for grabs as voters? Uh, or do you think that, like in California, <clears throat> instead it's just people following, but they're just going to be discontent, and, and you think that Clinton will continue to have that lead? What do you think about the six and ten who are still interested in following? So the first part was regarding satisfaction, just, yeah. And so I do think that, you know, uh, there were a lot of people on both sides that aren't happy with their choice, but I think they are kind of following the news to stay informed. But it is interesting to note that the share of people who are undecided or say they would not vote in the presidential race is really small. And so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that they've made up their mind, but they're at this point, they're, they're comfortable saying that they would vote for Clinton or Trump, um, whereas that's not what you see in the Senate race. And so I guess I would say that, you know, um, because of the lack of satisfaction, perhaps people are paying closer attention in the news to try to get some, some type of direction. 
despite the fact, which it kind of runs in the face of the fact that so few people say that they're undecided. And so um, I think there's probably a link between the satisfaction and the, the fact that people are paying attention, but also a link between the satisfaction, few people kind of uh, saying that they already know who they're going to vote for. So, yeah. Yes. And here. So I think the number that you said was 15% of people are voting for not one of the two major presidential candidates. I was wondering if based on other elections, if you feel like that's going to stay stable or a lot of those people are going to end up deciding that they do want to vote for one of the major candidates in the end. That's a really interesting question. Traditionally, I think the kind of literature would show that kind of third party candidates kind of, at least at a national level, kind of tail off the closer you get to the election. However, we're really not seeing that in this case. And I think the fact that, you know, so uh, few people are satisfied that perhaps it, it will be something that kind of sticks and, and that you will see, you know, the 15% uh, or more perhaps, who knows, vote for a minor party candidate. So it is a, an interesting election and when you look at the favorability ratings of, of candidates at the national level, these are two of the least favorable candidates uh, going back years. And so there is this kind of instinct to look elsewhere. Um, but I think as, as it becomes uh, apparent that, that those minor party candidates may not have a, uh, a huge impact on the race, and perhaps people will kind of shift and say, well, I really dislike this candidate or that candidate, and I want to make a difference. But it, it has, at least the national election um, standpoint, uh, persisted longer than what we find in the literature. So that, that's interesting, but we'll just have to kind of keep monitoring it as, as, as we move forward. Yes. Did the answers on uh, right track, wrong, wrong track, and economic pessimism and optimism did it vary significantly by any other variable other than the partisan partisan identification you looked at, like I, geography or anything? Like that? Um, you know, I I really haven't had time to look at at these at this survey specifically. There tends to be some optimism and pessimism uh, kind of across regions. Um, some, sometimes it's larger than other times. Um, and of course, we do find that uh, um, there are racial ethnic differences when it comes to these kind of overall mood questions, and some of that's being driven by, by party and region and other factors. But um, I encourage you, uh, very similar to this copy that I hold in my hand, uh, online you can get a PDF among all adults and among likely voters and kind of look at exactly all the subgroups and how they differ and yeah yes i'm sorry i'm not sure if this question was already asked um but in the senate race it seemed that there was a sizable chunk of individuals who said that they were not going to be voting and i wanted to know that if and i'm assuming that most of those are, are registered republicans um a sizable enough chunk that they could actually have con considerable influence on the race um what are the odds of them breaking? And if they break, I'm assuming they would break for Sanchez, so. Yeah, um, so in this month, we find 42% of registered Republican likely voters saying that they uh, would not vote in the Senate race. Um, I, I think that if, if, if you were to um, look, perhaps there, that, that going towards Sanchez would make more sense, perhaps if you kind of read that she's courting these voters and whatnot. Um, but I, I really, this is, we really don't know. So what we do know is that when it's the same party race in other races, say, uh, you know, District 32 or whatnot, that there is some drop off. But given that this is the first time we've seen a statewide race between two members of the same party, this is really gonna be, you know, kind of looking and finding out. And, you know, we'll be able to look at kind of what the drop-off is overall. And then, of course, there'll be, uh, I'm sure, a sizable amount of analysis looking at 
you know, was there this huge Republican drop off, or did they ended up, you know, end up voting in, the, you know, overall? Because forty two percent of a group that's that's not small could make a difference in in a election that's you know at least somewhat close. So um, that that's definitely something that we're interested in, and and then moving forward, at least we will have uh, some type of benchmark to know what to look for in future elections, but. At this point, we can just look at down party races, and that's not really, I mean, this is the second thing on the ticket, right? <laughs> second thing on the ballot. And so if you're going to the polls, you would expect that you would at least have some interest in voting for that. But we'll just have to wait and see. But that's, that's where a lot of my interest is, and uh, you know, hopefully if there's some exit polling and, and some, some uh, post-election analysis uh, that can kind of uh, shine some light on that. Anything else? Huh. Well, if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to you know stop by or to send me an email. But uh, it was great talking to you guys today. Thank you. Thank you.